Our guest in this segment is a crowd favorite. They love her. They can't get enough of her. I used to call her the bug lady, and then I found out, I think that name's actually trademarked by somebody or copyrighted or whatever it is. She wrote at the journal yeah. for a long time. Claire Stewart. Yep. Claire God Stewart. rest her soul. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we'll just call her our bug expert, Dr. Tracy Lesky from the USDA. Good to see you again, Doc. Good to see you. How are you? You are the funniest entomologist I've ever known. How many entomologists have you known? Counting you? Yeah. One. Okay. Well, <laughs> but you're still the funny. one means you cannot run stats on that data. Well, you know what, though? I think I probably have met a couple others. <laughs> okay, cool. But you are, you're a riot. We love having you on the program. And uh, on your left, it looks like you brought in a bunch of leaves and whatever. What is that? Well, I did bring leaves, but also inside are spotted lanternfly nymphs, which is what you would see right now in the field. Um, these are the immature stage. They're black with little white spots. Mm -hmm. They're good hoppers. They're kind of unhappy because I collected them. I won't tell well, tell you where exactly, but I was walking around Shepherdstown last night collecting lanternflies, and people were asking me, oh, do you have butterflies? I'm not like, no, they're lanternflies. And then they kind of got a look on their face like, who is this? So. <laughs> <laughs> what is this lady doing? Yes, exactly. But, um, yeah, so they're quite numerous now throughout the oh, region. I can see them crawling up the mesh. Yep, yep. And that's some uh, wilted tree of heaven in the bottom. Okay. And how big of a pest are these things now in the area? They are certainly more numerous, and I think people will be noticing them even more. Um, but in terms of crop pest, it's really our grapes, um, wine grapes and table grapes that they unfortunately love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I called you uh, when I heard a news story about what seems to be unfair a, a flying spider called a, as they say it's like two inches long it's from china the redeeming factor of it is that it eats spot and lanterns and and stink bugs apparently but there has no natural predator in america at this time what is a joro spider and colin do we have a photo of a joro spider we can slide across there it is Ah, uh, there it is. Okay, so Juro spiders are a type of orb weaving spire, spider. They're native to China, um, Korea, Taiwan, a few other places in Asia. Um, they were introduced into Georgia, South Carolina. Probably they were first identified around 2013. Um, it's a large orb weaver, but we actually have similar large orb weavers. Um, in, in the States. Coincidentally, um, Large Orb Weaver was Bill's nickname <laughs> in the Navy. <laughs> so Crazy, as that is. It, it was, is crazy. It was crazy, yeah. <laughs> and, and, how Tracy and, found, and how Tracy found out about that, we'll never know. Well, I'm not going to tell. Say, yeah. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, where's Bill? You mean the old Large Orb Weaver? I, yeah, I he's do. around the here somewhere. Well, the Golden Orb Weaver. That's oh. even better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and can we add a couple of diamonds in there as well? And a, sure. And a, and a ruby? Sure. So, yeah, so, so, yes, it is an invasive spider, but it is not the threat that it's being made out to be where you've seen, if you've seen the news stories where they're going to be parachuting in and these <laughs> large spiders. Yes. No. I don't want a flying spider no. landing on me. Well, so here's the thing. So spiders, even this um, juro spider, when they have their little baby spiderlings, and you might remember this from Charlotte's Web, the way they disperse, they balloon, they um, create a little silk thread, and they balloon away to spread. That is the only time that they're ballooning or parachuting in okay. when, they're, when they're like, you know, teeny tiny. So not something to worry about. And also, um, they're, so people are talking about their bite. So here's the thing. Almost all spiders, nearly all, have chelicerae, which are their poison jaws, which is what they use to inject venom into their prey. But the juro spider and most spiders are actually pretty shy. They want nothing to do with you. And in the case of juro spiders, their little chelicerae are so short that they can't probably pierce your skin very easily unless you're really irritated. Now, little chelicerae was Maria's nickname when she was six. <laughs> this is crazy how this is working. I, I, I'm not going to tell where I got all this information. Yeah. But. Now, now the, the spider, on the net, are there an advantage or disadvantage? Say they eat uh, mm -hmm. landing flies, eat mm -hmm. uh, uh, stink, stink bugs, bugs. Uh, so, but yet they don't bite, they don't uh, grow in great numbers. To me, that would be kind of a net benefit. Well, I mean, that's the question. So, 
you know, we don't know when a new invasive comes into an environment, what impacts it could have. Um, but certainly, you know, we'll take anything that'll take yeah. out some of these lanternflies and stink bugs. Um, but I think the bigger, the bigger part that I'd like to dispel is the fact that they can bite, but yeah. it's going to be difficult. And they do have poison, but all spiders do. And I think it's less worrying than, say, lanternflies or stink bugs that eat our food. Rob, you asked a second ago what impact the lanternflies have. And just in our property last year, walking down the lanes through the woods, you had a sense that the ground was moving underneath you. There were so many that's just uh, on oh, the wow. ground. Then you look at the trees, certain trees, and you, it's hard to see the bark. It was just there by the, appeared to be hundreds of thousands. William Whittington says they're all over Inwood right yeah. now. Yeah, so, and one of the issues, and you'll see it more in, in the later season, is that, and I know you like this word, Rob, they produce honeydew, which yeah. is... Um, oh, yeah. A sticky excretion, basically, <laughs> their pee. Um, and so. <laughs> that's not honey, dude. That's pee. <laughs> <laughs> that's pee. Um, and it gets, it sort of makes everything sticky. And then you have the fine fermentation process that makes it smell vinegary. And you can have city mold growing on lots of different surfaces, like your patio, your chairs. You know, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So they're just How big nasty. are those spiders, Tracy? I mean, oh, they look like sure. they're five feet long <laughs> in, the, in the picture oh, there, yeah. which is enough to... Yeah, of course. Movie. No, their body and the females are typically, most spider species are bigger than males because that way the male can't eat them before like they reproduce. So the female's body is up to about an inch long. Okay. And then they have pretty long legs. But, you know... Bill's friend, the golden orb weaver, which yep. is also known as the banana spider in Florida, they're about the same size. So if you've been in Florida, you may have seen something very similar to these Juro spiders. And, you know, I think they're kind of cool. Where do these spiders <laughs> like to hang out mostly? Uh, they're going to create a web between, you know, a couple of uh, anchor posts, maybe between telephone poles, um, trees, something where they can have that large net to collect their prey Whereas items telephone poles are like a block apart well s sometimes it's like okay you have the to like a pole and then you have some wires and they'll just kind of put oh, it in there because i'm like thinking you're net. talking like a block long web <laughs> like some kind of japanese <laughs> no. horror movie from the 50s well do you know what the i so i learned this yesterday while i was reviewing Juro spider what we do know about it do you know where the name came from i don't so it's from uh it's a shortened name based on Japanese folklore, and it's based on the this uh, legend that a uh, Joroguma is a spider that can turn into a woman who then controls all the spiders and takes over. It it seems so. Anyway, it's it's like kind of like you know, this is sci-fi A kick stuff. butt, a female. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wonder Woman. I'm Gail the of Spiders here. Uh, Tracy Lesky, doctor from the USDA uh, with us, and uh, she's been doing this program with us, I don't know, 10 years probably. I think it's longer now. When did the stink bug emerge in our area? Oh, gosh, oh. 2010. And that's when we first started yeah. having you on the show. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, you haven't aged, but I have. How does that? No, work? I feel like I've aged. <laughs> <laughs> well, so where do the stink bugs? I mean, I'm just always amazed. You know, my I feel like my office is hermetically sealed, and then they're all over the place. How do they get in? Where do they? Are come you still from? seeing a lot of stink bugs? Yeah, yeah. Really, I don't see that many anymore. I mean, not. A ton time, right, right. like at one time, but they, I'm just like, where do they come from? Right. So. We had a PhD student who was, um, he was entomology and architectural engineering. And so he determined how large a space a stink bug can fit through. So if you want to truly hermetically seal everything, it's pretty darn small. And in fact, they can kind of flatten themselves to get through spaces that are like, a couple of millimeters, you know, or centimeters, mm -hmm. I should say, um, like one or two centimeters. I forget. I have to look back at his, his dissertation, but it was crazy. So it's really hard to keep them out. So sorry. That's okay. <laughs> and then you think they're dead. I mean, you're I ready to take them to their, you know, their great their great ride in the toilet um, <laughs> and and yet they then they perk up. Well, you know, you know they're they're basically just overwintering in your house. They're not paying rent. They're just waiting for spring. And so the, they kind of 
keep still and quiet to reserve their energy for spring when they have to get out they got to feed they got to find a mate they got to do a lot before they do die but sure. but now we see maybe on a given time five ten whereas mm-hmm. back in 2010 right. we'd uh, save hundreds of thousands is there any possibility at all that the five or ten are going to grow in large numbers again you know, probably not, never to the degree that we saw in 2010 because, one, we have the samurai wasp now locally and throughout a lot of the eastern U.S., which is a predator from its native range. It's a parasitoid that lays its eggs in the eggs of stink bugs, and it's a pretty good, you know, partner for us. Um, mm-hmm. Along with a lot of other things, we have um, a lot of generalist predators that consume them, and we even have some... Um, what we would call entomopathogens pathogens that uh, affect them too and can also reduce population. So probably not, but you know, on warm, dry years like we had last year, there were definitely more that went into overwintering than we had seen, you know, the yeah. previous couple of years. Where have the cicadas gone? I, we expect <laughs> to have an infestation of cicadas this year. We so. are, n- unfortunately, we were not part of the broods that we're emerged not. this okay. year. So our cicadas that emerged in let's see what was it now was it 2014 plus some 21 i had to add Mm -hmm. um so uh they are beneath the soil right now um feeding happily on roots as nymphal cicadas Mm -hmm. and we won't see them again until whatever 21 yeah 38 yeah thank you for the math i'm here to do math for you (laughs) (laughs) what i do (laughs) yeah so but there what there's a a 17 year there's a 13 Mm -hmm. year Yep. And then there's a year where they all come together at the same time. Well, that was the first time since so, sometime during the Civil War where there two these two broods aligned to yeah. emerge during the same time period. So, yeah. But it's so cool. I love them so much. Well, but and the other thing is, like, when I first, the 17-year brood, I was living in Fairfax. Yeah. And we, were, we had a house that was surrounded by trees. And yeah. we didn't know what the deal was. We started <laughs> seeing these holes in the ground. Yeah. Which was weird. It looked like somebody or aerated cool. the land. Or weird if you're not an entomologist. Cool. <laughs> well, they did. They aerated for you, which yeah, is did. nice of them. And and they were everywhere. And yeah. then, so, oh, that's the 17-year cicada. Mm-hmm. And then in 2004, I moved. I was in a place that was surrounded by trees. But over time, there's more development, and there are fewer trees. So when they come out of the ground, there's a cement foundation above them. What do they do? Well, some of them stay there, never to be you know have their moment in the sun honestly um so that's kind of sad and so they don't like side burrow till they find a way out they can try it, i guess it just depends on you know how far they're able to go at that point because the last thing they do before they emerge they they're they're preparing to be adults so they're finally feeding they're molting and they're getting ready to go and all of a sudden they hit a brick wall which is very (laughs) sad (laughs) because i mean you're waiting 17 years that's a long time for an insect and you live for what like a month yeah well above ground yeah 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 right now they're just being little vampires you know sucking the life out of roots but not that bad don't worry (laughs) (laughs) you have a way with words Uh, so this uh, this Joro spider is it a is this like a here to stay kind of thing? Does this now become part of what you do all the time? Well, uh, we are not studying them yet. We haven't seen them locally yet. But um, if they do, sure. And we have a couple of undergrads in our lab right now that are doing surveys of spider species locally that feed on spotted lanternflies. So asking questions like one. If the if it gets if a lanternfly gets stuck in, a, in its web, will it stay or can it get out? And two, if it's there, will they feed on it? And so we want to understand around buildings and things like that. Um, you know what spiders are really good. Uh, we'll say partners with us on lanternfly. So um, you know we'll know more after this year. They did a first season last year, and we saw things like um, orb weavers and comb footed spiders being very good. Working on, working on the assumption that our merger with spiders do not really materialize, how do we take care of the landing flies with this massive infestation? Yeah, so we, we're going to be starting a project where it's kind of a two-fold thing where we want to also wipe out Tree of Heaven. 
So mm-hmm. Tree of Heaven is like, you know, kind of the basis for their establishment and spread. They can feed and reproduce and, you know, complete development on other plants, but Tree of Heaven is by far superior. So And I'm, excuse me, and I understand you do not just cut down a tree of heaven. You cannot. Because they if you cut one down there's gonna be fifteen roots <laughs> exactly. coming up within fifteen exactly. twenty minutes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Within fifteen, twenty minutes? Well they they lose, <laughs> yeah, they, they, kind they, of yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they, no, the study says within within 15 20 minutes after you cut one down they start regenerating a series of roots now that doesn't mean you're going to have another tree of equal size in 15 20 minutes but you're going to start the regeneration process within that short period of time so you have to kill the tree first before you cut it down yep so we have a there's been a it's a verticillium wilt. Verticillium non alfalfa is the scientific name. And basically, it kills Tree of Heaven. So it's a kind of a fungal pathogen that kills Tree of Heaven. Um, so we want to find out one, you know, can we take out stands of Tree of Heaven with this stuff? And two, if the lanternflies feed on an infected tree, can they take it to another tree and just create their own yeah. demise? Which yeah. I really love this idea so much. <laughs> but but you made you made a good point uh, yeah. that uh, the Tree of Heaven is the tree of choice. But if there are no Tree of Heavens available, then they'll go to I think walnuts is another one and, uh, and black walnuts, black walnuts uh, yeah. wild grapes. Yeah. But what the studies that we've conducted so far have shown is that when tree of heaven is not available and they have to feed on other stuff they don't produce as many eggs Mm -hmm. and so it is going to reduce overall populations it may not wipe them out but it will help and you know honestly tree of heaven was also used by brown marmorated stink bugs so if we can wipe out that tree maybe we won't have any other invaders deciding that's the the anchor host for them to set up shop Bill's, Bill's sounding kind of like an entomologist himself like over it. here yeah. with all like these. Uh, He's yeah. got a lot of trees. Yeah, he I does. Got a lot, and I have a <laughs> lot of tree of heavens, too. And, uh. I, and I went through this thought process last year. Mm-hmm. Let's cut them all down because literally the stink of the uh, uh, landing flies were everywhere last year. And I thought, just cut the trees down. And then research realized you cannot yeah. do that. Even the young saplings, you cannot cut down. you got to kill them first. The... Uh, uh, on our Facebook page, Brad Knoll said he's got a problem with too many black widow spiders. Tracy, is there a way of controlling those? Um. Oh gosh, that's a good question. I mean, are they are they in his home? I had one in my home once. Oh. I'm sure you made a pet out of it. I did. Yeah, I know. Her name was I'm going to have nightmares <laughs> over this whole segment tonight. I, mean, I had other things to usually, worry Usually, like, black widows, sometimes they're in wood piles or, you yeah. know, sometimes they get into structures. But usually... Maria's home? I've never seen a big infestation because they're kind of solitary. They don't, you know, they're both, they're individualized in that they're out to, you know, collect their own prey and, um, and set up shop. Are they the ones webs. that kill their mate? Yes. Yeah nice of them <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so are you, are you I, still I mean, single any, <laughs> any you know if you had to you know there are a lot of probably ready to use products that you could use if you had to kill to your kill mate spiders. or to kill the I'm not I'm not advocating for murder <laughs> over here so I'm not going to go any further <laughs> yeah uh, so, so uh, otherwise, uh, just deal with the spider. Uh, he said they eat the sp- they eat stink bugs. They do, they do. And you know what's really cool about black widows? They like run up behind their prey, they bite them, and then they run away, and they wait for them to succumb. And the reason they do that is then the prey dies. Plus, they're putting enzymes like to digest them because they don't actually like consume, you know, the flesh. They consume the contents. They're like they like a chitinous soup per se they're soup makers <laughs> Mary, how you doing over there <laughs> how much how much do you prepare for this show <laughs> i mean i just make sure i remember a few things to talk about so we're not just you know <laughs> what's, what's the uh what's the next infestation from asia asia must be a hell of a place to live by the way well we we trade back and forth, so I think it's That's you know good. it's Glad global travel for yeah. you. Yeah, um, we trade uh, uh, advanced technology, and yes. we get we get the and bugs. We get bugs. Back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that so, fair. well, one thing if you're going out west, like into Garrett County, Maryland, or out into Western Pennsylvania, you'll see a lot of defoliation this year, and this is actually from a native insect, fall cankerworm. Um, the caterpillars, which are inchworms. 
they belong to to the family Geometridae. We have a picture on the uh, TV. Yeah, screen. they're they're really um, huh. they're having a year. They're having a big thing. <laughs> so they're inchworms. They're so cute, but they're nasty and they're defoliating a, a large range of forests out there. So if you see that, if you're driving out along the Turnpike or 68 or anywhere out there, you'll see it. You'll and see it this year. What do we, what's being done about them? Well, it's a native insect, and a lot of our forest pests have these kind of cyclical outbreaks. And usually what happens is you get a big population over time, over a couple of years. And then because their densities are so high, some kind of, again, an entomopathogen will infect them. And because they're close together, it just spreads through the population. They crash, and it starts again. So, yeah, and when the right now, if their populations are high, so when their populations are low, they're green like that guy on your screen. But when the populations are high, they'll be a lot darker with some black stripes and stuff. So, yep. And do they kill the tree? They can, if, especially if you have a big drought kind of year or s other stresses. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, Bill, you're gonna have you're gonna have a better view pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm reading Gil Strap. Gil Strap. Gil Strap. Come. Gil Strap is saying uh, uh, Trace has released 200 spiders in one of the host car. The question <laughs> is, which car was it? That's got to be mm, Maria's. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, did not okay, do that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what are you gonna do with the spotted? Are you taking them back your to car? Town? Yeah, they're coming to my car. Well, I probably will just let them be free in my backyard but they'll probably just perish why because they're well, why, why don't you gas them Get well rid of them. we that's the thing like we do kill a lot of insects yeah. in the lab you know and there's a point where i feel a little bit guilty yeah. you know I, but honestly but, they're going to die in my backyard anyway because but, there's nothing but good for them flies being. there's no excuse to let them live. oh no there yeah. isn't there's not a good reason yeah. at all same with stink bugs yeah. yep bye bye Yep. <laughs> <laughs> is the emerald ash borer done with this area? Has it killed every tree and moved on, basically? Or what? Well, unless you've been um, having someone, you know, protect your trees with a systemic insecticide, they're probably dead. Let me speak to that if I can. And I, we course. did that. We had, uh, we've lost many ash, but mm -hmm. I did treat, I think, seven, eight trees, one of which appears to be dying now, even after mm -hmm. extensive treatment. Is that expected? Um, so there's still emerald ash borer out there, and a lot of times, even when some of the trees succumb, some of the some of the uh, ash will push up small saplings, yeah. and then you get more emerald ash borer going again. So there's still is some level of population, but the other thing is, if the tree was already stressed from the emerald ash borer, something else could get in and cause its final demise. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. What been, was the tree that died? That's what I'm talking is about. Is that yeah, the that's one? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's not dying. It's just limbs are breaking off. And, yeah. uh, but we've been treating it from day one, uh, yeah. going on uh, seven, eight years. So. Yeah, we have the same. Yeah. I have one white ash that we're yeah. trying to keep alive. Yeah. Killed mine. <laughs> but in our, in our development, which has a lot of trees, it killed every ash tree but one. Mm -hmm. which had no evidence of any infestation whatsoever. Well, there's this phenomenon known as standing, uh, what is it called? Lingering ash, lingering ash. And so the first time it was spotted was out in Michigan, one of the first areas that was infested with the emerald ash borer. So they've been looking at the genetics of those trees to see if there's some additional resistance that maybe we could breed into ash um, you know, for reforestation efforts. So maybe. What, was the damage massive to the ash tree population, basically, for lack of a better way of putting it, along the East Coast? Oh, gosh, yeah. Those, the, you know, um, emerald ash borer, the larvae basically girdle the tree, you know, as they're burrowing around and they're feeding on the cambium. So it's bad. I've it's heard, bad. Rob, in West Virginia, where we've had a lot of ash, something like 98 to 99% yeah. ash all died. That's astounding. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty bad. I think. Didn't they? Don't they make baseball bats out of ash? While they're alive, once they're dead, they're not good for mm. anything. Also, ash is probably the best of the firewood as long as it's cut green. But once it died, then it has little use. Huh, I didn't what, know what's that. What's that done to the baseball bat population? They do that? not use ash for those dead trees. Huh. From those dead trees. If 99% of the live ones were wiped out, then that's... That's, that's exactly... So yeah. you go to metal bats. You gotta get metal bats. <laughs> hate, hate that sound of ting or ping, man. Uh, it's got to be the crack of the bat. Hey, uh, Tracy, uh, final minute here. Anything else you can tell us about that we need to know about this spring? Yes, oh, I will tell you one thing that happened to me over the past week. And 
things that I worry about more than Juro spiders. That is chiggers. And I got... Oh, we just oh, talked about those yesterday. Did you? Yeah. Okay, I have uh, two ankles that are covered in chigger bites. And if I were going to worry about something, I hate chiggers. And so, you know, they're... Yeah, look, look. They're terrible. Do they get you like in, a, the, in the lab or at your house? No, I was... Uh, I don't know. I don't know where they yeah. got me. But yeah, they're horrible. So, then you know, they harvest mites, they, they, they attach to you, they... They feed on your cellular contents, and then they drop off, and then they become another life stage, and I hate them. Did they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you we used to say clear fingernail polish would kill them. Does that work? You know, I didn't try that. What I do is I cook them with my hair dryer, <laughs> and, and it, the heat seems oh, to break okay. down some of the histamines that are there from the reaction. So, you know, they talk about, you, you know. You mean the bites? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. I put the hair dryer on them. Because I'm thinking you had chigger is in your house? Yeah. No, I got them outside somewhere. I was going to say, that'd they're, be a they're long on extension the cord. <laughs> yeah, no, the... no, no, no. I, well, I, once I saw the, the bumps. You knew what it was. <laughs> Dr. Tracy Lesky from the USDA. Give her a hand. That was, that was oh, always, thanks. always fun. Very, it's always very great fun. to be here. Thanks so much for coming in.